streetcast nights. Okay. You just call this a Drewcast? Yep. <laughs> you freak. <laughs> so you're good? Yeah. I'll just start off by saying it's about damn time. But thank you for joining me for episode 13 of the DK podcast. I'm here with Mr. Daniel Cool, who is an authentic Australian man. You've heard of Florida man, but now we have Australia man, and he's joining us on the pod. Want to say hello to the listeners? Hello. Well, you know, rather. It's good. It's nice and early. So um, there may or may not be like bird noises coming through, cicadas, insect noises, because everything is just waking up now. Um, but there might not be. Well, that's part of what I'm looking to capture is your true Australian bushman essence. So the more uh, free and prompt to wildlife sound bites we get, the better. Yeah, that's fair. That's understandable. Do you have some pretty awesome songbirds about? Mm. What's that one bird that you always talk about and send the pictures of? Uh, magpie. Magpie. So shredding mags. Yeah, every... I think like most continents have a form of magpie, but I'm pretty sure only Australian magpies attack people. So <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. You could train them. You could sick them on whoever you so desired. Um, I think that would be against the Biosecurity Act to actually like train them um, in animal wildlife care, but you can definitely befriend them and make it so they don't attack you. And if they swoop people you don't like, that's on them. You know, that's not like a yeah. They have training their own, thing. They have their own free will. Yeah, um, it's like in the off season or in the season where they're not swooping and attacking people. If you kind of like feed them a little bit, um, if they can see you, like provide them shelter or like a perch or something then generally they'll always kind of try to be around you. But if you kind of be aggressive towards them or maybe act in a threatening way, they remember because they're corvids, I think that's the term. So like they're smart. They're really smart, right? You know, mm -hmm. you know, like crows and stuff smart. So they remember and they remember the types of people that they don't like. And they're like, okay, well, this is a threat. I have a child in the nest or a chick, a hatchling. Uh, I'm going to sweep you. And they get pretty vicious, which is pretty cool. I'm a big fan. We love vicious. I have a scar on my ear from, on both really? my ears, actually. From being, yeah. From just getting pecked on by magpies? <laughs> yeah, like here. So it's I like, you won't, have, up, you won't be able to see it, but it's like a, it's like a line. Um, when I was walking home, like from school one day, this magpie just comes up and just grabs my ear, just chomping at it. Mm. And so it made me bleed. And I have a scar there now from magpies. I, did, awesome. I didn't, I don't, I don't think I appreciated when you, exp I don't think I appreciated the degree to which you meant this is true. Like I didn't think oh, it was yeah. a common occurrence. Yeah, yeah. There's like, um, so during swooping season, which is like spring. Uh, the governments will put up, and city councils rather, will put up signs saying, this is a swooping area. You are in danger. Really? Like, yeah. It's, like, it's, like, really, a, uh, it's like, like a road sign almost, just like yield, but then just says like swooping magpies? Well, they're usually like um, like core flute material, you know, like um, political sign, you know, that sort of material. And mm -hmm. it's usually just like a little square that they zip tied to poles and trees and stuff. Hmm. And it's yeah, this is it's like high danger swooping area. That is <laughs> yeah. that is one of the more Australian things that I've heard in our conversations. I would say it's yeah. second only to though. I'd, I'd like to inform my American listeners that even lawn grass is dangerous in Australia. Right, mm. yeah, so I told you about that. They're called prickles or bindies, um, mm. which they are across the world, but for some reason, no one has this problem but us. I had never well, heard of them until we talked about it earlier. Yeah, they're just like these little spikes in the ground that you step on them and they hurt like hell. And mm. they have ruined many birthday parties 
and all that. Cause it's like, man, does this have prickles in it? I don't know. You got to walk on it. It's like, it just hurts. It's like little cow chops. Mm-hmm. And I will add that, yeah, uh, this is pretty cool. Me and Dan did have a debate about <laughs> the pronunciation of this word. And you've got it you, wrong, obviously. For those of you who want to look it up, it's spelled B I N D I I. And Dan insists that it's pronounced Bindi, and everyone else in Australia will say that. But I'm still confident that it's pronounced Bindi I. Right. But, um, you know, it's like one of those things like Nike says that their shoes, that their brand is called Nike, right? But everyone wait, 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 wait. calls it Nike. Nike says so, that they're Nike? Or Nike says that they're Nike? Yeah, that, that happened like years ago. I don't. But everyone just says Nike, Nike because like, it's like who's right? The people who made it or the rest of the world? Obviously the rest of the world. What do Australians say? Like, Nike. Hmm. I so, heard that maybe some Australians yeah. say Nike, but I might be wrong. I think it's one of those things where people, you know, you've probably met these people who want to be like fancy, who sort of, it's like, no, it's actually pronounced this way. And it's like, shut the fuck up. You know, <laughs> just say it like the rest of us. You know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, those pretentious assholes who like to, yeah, the, the type of people that like to drop facts on you. Yeah, so bindies. And I don't think even all of Australia calls it bindies. It's, we usually just say prickles where I live. Um, yeah, it's just bindi. Or bindi <laughs> <laughs> anyway moving on uh, so real quick what is why did I even allow you in here what is your interest in wildlife why are you here and what do you have to contribute what are your interests right now what are you going to school for let's talk about that right today. right so why why am I here is because we started talking because we have a a podcast that we both like to, to watch, listen yes. to, and be part of the community. And then I guess you're just generally fascinated by me, which is understandable. Uh, <laughs> well, I wouldn't go that so, far. <laughs> I would. So <laughs> I know you would. I study, I go to university currently mm. doing a Bachelor of, uh, of Science, majoring in biology, which is which is pretty cool. And it's not just like wildlife. There's no single focus on the major of biology. It's just like microbiology, wildlife. There's the ecology and populations aspect of it because that relates to both large and small things, you know, like bacteria and whatnot. They still live in populations which might be spread in certain ways and, and have restrictions in certain areas the same way that yeah, uh, like a tiger would, for example. Mm. So that's that's the major is just biology, and then my mind is is wildlife ecology and um conservation. No, uh, not sorry. Conservation is part of wildlife ecology. My second minor is environmental science. So environmental science is still a natural science, but like nature essentially so like trees bit of rocks ponds and stuff and how that affects everything else and gets affected by disturbances natural unnatural um how to keep them going you know how to keep the trees actually healthy how plants interact with each other and whatnot so that's pretty cool and um so one one interesting thing the difference between an australian university degree and uh, one from the United States is you will generally do four years for a bachelor and we do three years which causes problems with um, like immigration to the US because you need like a four-year degree most of the time but so we have a a three-year bachelor's degree because we don't have that general education first year that you guys Mm -hmm. seem to have so every time I talk to someone from the US it's like they did like psych 101 or some something like that and they're doing like a math degree it's like but um and or you know there's something like that there's also general like a language requirement it seems yeah where we can do language as a minor or even uh, even as a major 
but to finish my degree i don't need to be able to speak spanish or german or anything you know there's no requirements for me to know something else so i've always found that interesting i don't know if you find that interesting probably probably do maybe you I, have like thoughts where it's like it's it's better that way maybe it's worse that way i didn't even know that, that was the case that had never um come up in our conversations but that's very interesting because i never th so let me think my school you have about it might be like six gen ed requirements and that at that point does become like almost a semester of of work by itself we have like literature requirements non-literature requirements um there's one called a cca which is cross-cultural awareness and then there's an sts which is um science i think it's like science and technology and society or something so it kind of gets that broad okay. scope of science and humanities but yeah i definitely mm -hmm. agree that a lot like a lot of these gen ed classes are just kind of like random things that will often have no way on your interests like i have i consider myself a pretty good writer but i like really don't care about like english courses you know but i'm still am required to take them so that's but interesting that it's like hmm because you know there's one aspect where so i go straight i did have to do like base level science to begin with which yeah, yeah. wasn't exactly biology but just like classes to get you acquainted with the scientific method um mm -hmm. i do two subjects which covered all of the different sciences so one subject was split up between environmental science biology and earth science and then the other subject was like physics chemistry and math i guess i don't really remember and then you know so there was that but then the rest has, I've just been doing biology stuff, right? Yeah. So it's like, maybe it's better to just get these people in straight into their want to do, you know, what they want to do and then out and it only takes three years and you've now yeah, you're a biologist kind of thing or a physicist or a, I don't know how long a teaching degree is, but you know, anything like that. Or, and it's like, if you want to learn, more you do it yourself you know you you buy english books literature books and learn yourself or okay get people in and get this base level knowledge like general knowledge you know your your literature stuff you, the english course you said you have to do so that way you're better at communication that way you're better at just writing in general and maybe have a larger vocab rather than just trusting people to learn stuff themselves so is one better or not i don't know but i have maybe i have a couple caveats that hey how old were you when you started uni 23 okay so i started so our semester goes from start of the year to the end of the year because you know uh, summer is, is your winter kind of thing yep. so semester one starts today for me march and then semester two starts in august so i started my degree mid-year entry so mm -hmm. in the second semester just before my 24th birthday so i started yeah i started at 23 no hang on i've got to think about this no just before my yeah i don't know it doesn't matter <laughs> you, were 23, um, you were 23 or 24 somewhere in there right no i started at 24 just before my 25th birthday so I'm 26 okay. now. Um, Had a boy. Well, I, yeah, you kind of sort of forget like after after 18, it's like nothing really matters. Um, see, so I started, you know, mid 20s essentially, right? Mm. So, and I feel like that's been beneficial. But you know, we don't have to talk about that too much because you did ask me about my wildlife interests, so we can go I'll back just, to that or keep talking about this. No, we can expand on it because what I was wanting to say was that unlike a very high proportion of at least Americans, uh, college level students, and I don't know exactly the demographic in Australia, but you and I have talked a lot about how you feel that it's been very beneficial that you started your, your uh, higher education after a lot of people would have already ended it. So you've had that time to work 
make money, become more of a mature person. Because I, you know, no matter how it's legally defined, I think we'd agree that an 18 year old is definitely not really an adult. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so I think in relation yeah. to, in relation to gen eds there, I think it's interesting because I think the argument, you could argue that gen eds can, a, like I know a, a very large percent of people change their majors. And I'd say, anyone listening to this, if you're A, going into college on certain of your major or B, you're already there, um, never feel like it's too late to change your major. But I know a lot of people do. I actually did after my freshman year. So I think gen eds can be good as a way of kind of expanding your horizons to like different to different types of education and different paths because you may have rushed yourself into the major that you chose but at the same time i'd argue that in the us at least there's definitely a culture of if you're someone who's looking to get a higher education you need to graduate and then bam three months later already be into your uh your major of choice so i think it's interesting because my argument for gen eds here hinges on you being an immature human being who doesn't know what they want but on the other side of it i definitely think we need a culture shift whereas people don't people who want to go to university don't have to right after high school yeah hang on so so with the gen ed stuff it's also like a buffer right so like you know you've got that year i guess to choose what your major may be so I'm guessing like those gen and courses, they don't have to lead a certain way. Like they don't have to lead to science. They don't have to lead to psychology. They don't have to lead to medicine. They're just like general education to get yep. you smart. So then that gives you, I guess you guys graduate at like 17, 18, 19 high school. 18. 18. Okay. So that takes you up to 19 before you choose your major. Well, That's you usually, so I don't know how, I don't know how it works for you, but, oh, I got what you're saying. But I was gonna say, yeah, so, so you get that. we usually, we usually choose our majors going in though. So yeah, like, so do we, but I mean, so you are able to change. You can, you've still got that ability to change. Yeah, which absolutely. is Which is good. Well, we, we can do that. It's just a hassle because like you've already done so many units, so many subjects of maybe like the science course. If you're one yeah, year it's the in, same, you do... it's the same way here, depending on a lot of things. It depends on yeah. how drastically you change. You know, if you're going from like my change was within science. So mo like we were talking about your freshman year courses are a lot of like general biology, general chemistry, stuff like that. So those transferred over where I didn't like yeah. I didn't miss a lot of things that I had to make up for. Yeah. So, but I think it's good. And it, when you're talking about age entry into university, college, higher education. Yeah. I think it is like absolutely disgusting that schools promote it so heavily. Like I want people to do the best courses they can whilst in school. So in my state, this is now defunct, but we had something called OP classes and pre-vocational. Pre so when, if you did OP, it was like the smart kids who did it essentially. The ones who wanted to go to university, you do them, you get an OP ranking from one to 25. One is like, you're going to be a doctor, engineer, whatever. 25 is like, you're a drop shit. You you know, you're, you're a drop, drop shit. shit. I never heard a that drop, before. A, a drop kick and you're going oh, to- <laughs> and like like you're you're stupid um, is, it, what is, is it a standardized test is that what it is it's the it's all your grades from years 11 and 12 and then a standardized test which oh, gives okay. you SOP. Um, a combination this, of do you call it gpa or do you call it something else uh in university of gpas but when i went to school there wasn't like a gpa but that system is now defunct and there's now like a one to a hundred ranking system, um, which a hundred is like you're smart and whatever. And yeah. and so you've got that. And then you've got pre-voc, pre-vocational, which you do like if you just like, if you're pretty sure you want to go get a trade. If we more do apprenticeships than trade skills, but it's like, if you want to, you know, electrician trade, uh, apprenticeship, plumber, et cetera. 
So I actually want people to do, you know, the best classes they can in, in high school. But the fact that it's like you got to go to university or rather we really recommend you go to university. So I think that's just not right because you go to school for 12 years. Uh, I think we, we do 13 years of school now. Um, you start like one year earlier and then, yeah, like a three years bachelor. So that's 15 years of straight up straight education. And that's not, that's not healthy, I don't think. And I think most people will benefit from going into a workforce soon after, maybe like part-time, like in between like 15 and maybe 30 hours a week, eventually working full-time for an, a year, a couple of years. And then like going on some mad adventures with your mates, you know, see parts, different parts of your own country, see oh, different yeah, parts of, of the world. And then you can be like, because like you might be graduating high school and be like, yeah, I want to be a biologist. But man, it's hard. It's really hard work. And in most, in a lot of countries, it's kind of expensive. But you might be thinking that and then you go overseas, maybe you meet some biologists because you do some volunteer work. Um, you might meet other people in other professions and you might be like, oh, actually, I don't really want to be a biologist. I want to just like work for the national park system, like just doing environmental science or something completely different. You might be going through some bad times. You meet a psychologist who really helps you and you're like, wow, I'd like this person had a huge impact on my life that I never thought would happen. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of like what they've done. I want to do that. Or you might go into humanitarian stuff. Um, and what I'm really most passionate about is I think there should be forced to have a gap between graduating high school and doing a teaching degree. That's the biggest thing I, I, I think. But yeah, just like most people, I think should just like chill. It's like, hey, you don't need to go to university straight away. Like do this other stuff. Because most people drop, or I shouldn't say most, but a lot of people drop out in the first year. Mm. And then you, you've already got that debt now. And you're like, you didn't even, you've got this debt that that you didn't get anything from. You've wasted time maybe. You know, there's there's a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm pretty passionate about that. I think it's easier to function as a university student better if you have a little more insight onto kind of how the world works in terms of like being an adult, paying your bills, being accountable for yourself. Like if you just go from high school to uni, you never really have that real world, like world experience. And you yeah. can't get that world like you in your case, you've worked and you've made your own money and you've been accountable for yourself. So you can kind of go through your major and you can go through your classes with, with also looking ahead to a your career aspirations, but b how that's going to fit into the broader picture of your life, how you are going to support yourself and have a rewarding career. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, I've been able to put myself in a position work-wise where I'm like, I'm not just entry level, like retail employee or something where I've got like a terrible manager who like, even though they're just on wages as well, they kind of want to be unhelpful with you, you know, it's like if you're, I know some people, it's like they they work in, in retail or hospitality or whatnot. They know their classes, like the schedule, weeks ahead of time. So then they go to the boss and they're like, hey, I'll, you know, I'll need Fridays off because I'm in, I'm at university all day and whatnot. And they've just gone, no, we're not going to allow that. Mm. Like you, you've got to put us first. And it's like, bro, it's an entry level job, you know, I can yeah. work every other day. Some some are awesome, some are not. But I've been able to put myself in a position where, so I'm, you know, it's like mid mid level, I guess. But it's right next to the university. I can walk there afterwards, and the team I work with are actually like super supportive, and they say to me, they're always like, "Have you done your assignments yet?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Ah, I mean, come on." And you know, they 
when when you're in a position of good responsibility, you don't have to work for the sake of work. You know, so if you're working yeah, in retail and there's no customers and it's like, there's actually nothing to do, you'll get like a manager's like, oh, you're doing nothing. Go get like spraying wipe, you know, and just wipe down a bench or something mm-hmm. like busy work where I've been able to put myself in a position where it's like, I'm in an office, I can do my work, but when there's downtime, I can go through my lecture notes or something because everyone's mature and everyone recognizes there actually is downtime where there's nothing to do because you're waiting on like response from someone else or whatnot. And that's really helpful. Now some downsides, and I think you'll probably agree with this, of waiting is that some of my first classes was a heavy, like math heavy, right? Yep. You've probably done that. Now, it was eight or nine years since I had done advanced level math. Ooh. You <laughs> that know, calculus might have kicked your ass, huh? So, something just fell. It's kind of like stormy outside, so you may have just heard something crash. Um, so, you know, I've done math in terms of like my finances and I've done this some other, like I read about stuff, trying to work stuff out. Um, you actually do use Pythag quite a lot in the real world in construction and stuff like that, but like real calculus, man, yeah, it had been eight years, mm. like derivatives and stuff. It'd been eight to nine years since I last used it. So first day class, they're like, yeah, this is like pretty basic math. If you've done math B, which is like the advanced math, mm. uh, you should be fine. And I was like, ah, that was eight years ago. And the girl yeah. went, rip. Because <laughs> 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 she was my age and she was a tutor um, for this. And she's like, oh yeah, I graduated that time too. But I've been doing it since. I was like, yeah, I haven't been, man. I haven't. I haven't been doing math for a long time. I haven't done like assignments for that amount of time. I've done write-ups. I've written articles for certain people in in the industries I'm in. Um, But yeah, like I haven't done any of that for so long. So I I think, I think you'd agree that that might be a benefit where you leave high school and you are just continuing on your education. So that's, that is one of the benefits, whether it outweighs what I perceive as cons. I don't know. Maybe you'll yeah, I mean, have some thoughts on this. I was on the other side of that in that I was taking calculus my senior year of high school. And then three months later, freshman year of college, I was also taking calculus. So yeah. it's like it was fresh in the mind compared to you living a portion of your lifetime without having done it and then jumping back into it. But as far as if the pros or the cons are, the end all be all, I think the main point to focus on is is that it's very individualistic. And that's why absolutely that's why you and I agree that the culture of saying get your call your high school diploma and then immediately go to college is bad because that can be a very, very good option for some people, but it can also be a very, very bad option for others. So there shouldn't be a baseline. It should just kind of be do what you want based on what you what your situation is and way kind of where you are in life so that you can make that informed decision for yourself instead of just going with what everyone else is doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now I do think that it's beneficial for most people to get some sort of at least qualification because I mean, being like, like job qualification, what do you, yeah. Um, more like a trade at the very least or, okay you know, just, I don't think you have these, but like certificates, I don't know if you have like vocational level business certificates or whatnot, but even that would be useful because at least it's like a stepping stone to send you somewhere else. Um, Yeah. And if you combine that with work experience, then that's even better a lot of the time than a qualification or a degree without work experience. So I think getting some sort of qualification 
is important, but just for it to be like pushed and pushed and pushed, I, I don't like that. And I think it causes unnecessary stress and just like anxiety. Mm. You know what I mean? Like people are like, oh, I don't really know what co- what major I want. I don't really know what degree I want. So they're in it. And in the US, student loans are extreme. Preach. So you're just putting <laughs> like someone in tens of thousands or I guess hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and they might not even want to have been there. They may have just wanted to be an electrician rather than like an electrical engineer, you know? Yep. So yeah, I'm very passionate about that. Um, yeah, I feel the same way. So I'll, yeah. I'll bring I'll bring it back to kind of our wildlife interests here because that is why we're here after all. Um, what are you hoping to do once you have graduated in the context of wildlife? So to begin with, I'll most likely be happy to try and get some sort of government position or mm. or university position where where we'll be conducting studies on um I guess just like on salary, um partaking in just whatever jobs are available in terms of conservation or agriculture, since we have all of that here. End goal would be some sort of education role or consulting. So I'd want media to be part of this, not like TV media or anything, but just some sort of platform or format where I can teach people about conservation in Australia, because it is vastly different to the needs to what conservation is in the United States, Canada, Europe is just like a mess um, and definitely Africa. Our, our conservation needs are, are wildly different and they're lost on even people who call themselves conservationists and, mm. and animal lovers. So I would want to put myself in that kind of role and then be able to consult. And this may, may end up stretching myself too thin, but consult with landowners. So like, um cattle station managers or crop farmers on ways to use them land more efficiently and ways that will be able to reintroduce native habitat while still having high yield rates because like you know you've probably seen like farms it's like huge clear-cut areas which is a disaster ecologically but like they need money and we need food so i understand why they do it there's huge clear-cut areas and just one big crop now more and more there are different ways to farm with the same yield rates but reintroducing like forestry reintroducing Mm. you know maybe different plant types native and this is yeah, native plant types. And this is really important for Australia, not just because we want like our environment back, but because different plants have different burn rates. So if you have one monoculture, they all have the same like burn rate, you know, the same temperature where they light on fire. Yep. Which means one thing lights on fire, then you suddenly have 2,000 acres of fire. Because, mm. I mean, 2,000 acres here is a small farm. That's a, that's a small farm. Yeah. So it can be like hundreds of thousand acres just up like that. And that's what happened this time last year, early 2020, late 2019. So if we can get farmers to understand the benefits of having natural fire breaks, so trees, um, forestry, even just different crops and whatnot, then at least that introduces a way, you know, stop gaps for fires. Yeah. And that's that's really important because that's a bit of knowledge that's lost, I think, to a lot of farmers because it's like, man, it's tough being one. It is so tough being a farmer. And it's like, well, let's say you've got like 5,000 acres worth of land and you've already cleared cut 3,000 acres and you're doing okay. It's like, well, if we just cut the rest we'll be able to plant more crops, which means we'll be able to get more money. But then they've 
there's like lost that part where it's like actually we need that bit of forestry you know to prevent erosion to prevent fires to have pollinators around so ideally if i can get into consulting and then into informative media i think yeah. that would be that'd be like the end end goal i know that right. sounds pretty good i know what do you want to do uh, i'm on a similar path to you in that regard but i will be adding grad school so, right like so hopefully through a phd track and i've looked at a number of schools number of programs um and yeah i mean i hope to do meaningful research with some lab somewhere probably similar to the one that i'm at in clemson put out publications make new discoveries and then after that i, I really am passionate about teaching as we've both talked about um so I'd like to do post postdoctorate research and likely obtain some type of pr professorship position or other teaching position, maybe an assistant professor. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm very passionate about as we've talked about. And like we've said, we both share that interest in media. I've started this podcast to spread different topics of wildlife to teach people who may not have access to these media generally. And it's just something I love. Um, so I like that we share that. Uh, and I also, good. I'm also glad that you touched on how different conservation is in Australia versus the U.S. In our prior talks, you've really blown my mind with a lot of kind of the the sentiments of Australian con or not the sentiment. You've blown my mind with kind of just the way that Australian conservation issues function and how they manifest relative to the U.S. Yeah. My favorite, arguably, would be uh, through hunting. I know you're a right. big hunter, and it just blew my. You, you want to kind of tell people how hunting the culture is different, and what you hunt for is different in Australia versus the U.S. Right. So I've been hunting for years and years now, and I do not get along with the hunting community at all. Um, so first of all, when I go out hunting, I wear UGGs and what you would call sweatpants. Um, yeah, we'll talk. I pretty yeah. much, I pretty much don't wear camera. So that, that's like one reason why they don't like me. But when we're talking about how it's different in the US, it's like for different reasons. So it was like Aldo Leopold or Roosevelt, some old dude that's dead now, introduced the idea of hunting as conservation. Yep. How that works is there's an understanding that it's like look humans have impacted the environment and mm -hmm. people are like oh well that shouldn't have happened it has happened so got to get past that yep which means parcels of land have been set aside um for the bureau of land management for like parks and wildlife the different organizations you have there mm. within those systems there's a set carrying capacity of the different species of animal do you want to define that for people just loose real quick you don't have to get into it this the, the capacity of animals that can be carried in the land essentially so if you have like a square right yep. i'm just gonna like make up numbers just for easiness and i'm gonna use metric so if you've got like one you kilometer bastard. by one kilometer square <laughs> the 1k by 1k square perhaps this um has a population of white-tailed deer in it yep. and it can safely sustain a hundred white-tailed deer mm. i don't know if i don't know enough about white-tailed deer in the u.s system to say whether one climber is enough but let's just say that it can sustain a hundred now they will breed and they will increase population each year because they don't know that they've only got one kilometer by one kilometer you know square and again, people just got to get past that. We have to have houses, I guess. There's dams, there's highways and stuff. It's just what's happened. So they'll breed, which means whichever state is taking care of this land, biologists there will look at it and say, okay, we will set up this tag system where we will sell maybe 50 tags because then that will bring the number back down to 100. A tag is a 
a right to hunt or to take a deer. Yeah, that. and you can get them like at hunt shops and yeah, the local Walmart there and stuff. Which means that population is sustainable, and that puts money into that area. Which means you know the government can keep it without being like, oh well, this area isn't making money. We should sell it to some corporation. Which again is just what happens. People got to sort of get past that. Mm. If an area isn't making money, your government is going to sell it. That's like any country. So, you know, in that way, hunting is conservation because it's putting money into the area and it's usually taking out the animals which are dumb enough to get hunted, the non strong ones, essentially. <laughs> and, you know, people are like, oh, trophy, hunt trophy hunting is bad. But the thing is, if everyone's going for deer with really big antlers, that means they're going after older deer, which maybe cannot breed as much anymore. Maybe they're bullying the younger deer and making sure that they can't breed. So like going going after the biggest deer possible, people will be like, oh, that's it's because, you know, whatever. <laughs> but, but no, it's actually good. It's actually like a good thing. And yeah. you're hunting a native. Now, the important part is that's a native animal. You do have hogs and um, neutro rats are invasive to other parts of the US than where they're local from, but just like deer, elk and stuff. And you want to take like one. It's usually like one per hunter. Or whitetail in like Wisconsin in the upper area because of farmlands that like plagues and whatnot. Yeah. But like elk is like one. A bear is like one. You take one maybe per year if you can even get the tag. No, yeah. Australia. And that's how hunting is conservation. It's because you're that's, allowing that's, them to breed. And that's right? the general structure in the US, yeah. And actually, I, I, won't, I won't go into another continent, but yeah, it's allowing them to breed and putting money into their area directly for that animal's benefit. Australia, we have deer and we have pigs and all this, but they're introduced animals. Um. Also, Lenovo laptops, the screen bounces a lot. So I'm trying to minimize that, but you'll get that. Um, so we can hunt introduced animals. And the first thing people will say is, but it's humans' fault they're introduced. So it's mean to kill them. It's like, yep, that's nice. I'm going to kill it anyway. <laughs> so, like, it's just what has to happen. So the Australian continent has, like, grown up with, like, evolved with, mostly soft-footed animals like macropods, kangaroos, um, monotremes like echidna and platypus. Yep, all marsupials. Stuff like that. Yeah, marsupials. So then, because of reasons, things like pigs were introduced, cats, rabbits, deer, and all that. And they cause problems. So cats are killers. Like everyone knows, cats kill everything. Cats so are they serial kill, killers. Yeah, they kill a lot of birds. They outcompete our smaller carnivores, um, like quolls and whatnot. Um, and then they also kill quolls. They will kill lizards. They're apparently responsible for, I think, like over a billion dead native animals a year in australia that's quite a lot that's yeah. that's like that's like a lot and that's not just feral cats that's domestic outdoor cats as well but oh, let's continue on we've got foxes and which do the same thing and that's not good so those ones we need to kill and it's generally accepted that we need to kill those because the hardcore animal lovers will be like oh but mittens it's just a cat, you know, we should do catch and release, catch, spay and release. But if that cat is one year old, that's going to live for another 10 years in the wild. Mm. So we don't want that. So generally people are okay once presented the information with cats being killed. Pigs do a lot of damage to both agriculture and um, just other mammals because they eat ground nesting birds, they root around and dig up roots they will also out compete do all that generally accepted to kill pigs and yeah. same with the united states it's generally accepted now where people 
even hunters get iffy about is like deer. Okay. Because deer are herbivores and it's like they kind of just roam around, eat grass, and vibe. But that's not really what they do because they are large bodied herbivore, much heavier. Yeah, heavier than like kangaroos and over a smaller surface area. So, you know, a kangaroo has like this large sort of foot that it lands on, spreads yep. the, the weight. Whereas deer, you know, have these like, small paws. Yep. So, yeah, so they will collapse waterways, same with like horses, mm. collapse waterways, trample the land, trample weed, uh, so trample native flora but also spread weeds like introduced weeds mm -hmm. quite a lot further than well one something that doesn't eat it but anything further than like a kangaroo would deer also then outcompete kangaroos and other herbivores they also kill trees which doesn't happen too much in the u.s but here it does because it's through a something called girdling or ring barking so when antelopes are growing they like grow this velvet felt and I guess they're like itchy or something because yeah. they rub their head. It's called rubs. Mm -hmm. um, it's how you track a deer through rubs. They, you know, rub a tree. And when you rub a tree too much, it kills it. There's actually one way how to kill a tree is you get a chain, put it around and like twist it, I guess, because it kills the capillaries, like cuts off the capillaries which means the tree can't get nutrients anymore, mm -hmm. right? So deer do that to trees which haven't evolved with that happening, which yeah. means they they can actually kill forests, but you don't even know that there was a forest there because all the trees are dead, you know what I mean? Like, it looks like there's just a deer in a field, but 20 years ago, 100 years ago, that field was actually forestry, it's just that the deer have killed the trees. Yeah. So they are terrible for the environment. But let's say you're an animal lover. How fucking cute Hypothetically, if I were an animal, which I'm totally not. Okay. <laughs> hey, you know what I mean? Like, like how, how cute a deer? Well, the idea of a deer. Yeah, Bambi, the cute Bambi. little hooved animal, yep. So if you're a city person and you hear that there's a deer cull going on or people are hunting deer, you're like, that's horrendous. Without the context, the deer aren't even native to Australia. And they do all these terrible things. Now, if you're a hunter and you love hunting, do you want deer eradicated? If you are someone, let me rephrase that. If you are someone who enjoys hunting deer, do you want there to be no more deer? Yeah. No. Right. So a lot of Australian hunters, like deer hunters, have this american mindset of like just kill one mm -hmm. you know and leaves like you're seeing comments all the time when someone's killed like many and you know they post up the photos i don't like doing that but you know they put up the photos on facebook or whatever like in the hunting groups people are like oh you should leave some for the rest of us or you know she you should only take what you need to eat and stuff which is fair in the u.s that makes sense but here landowners so like crop cattle whatnot they want the whole population of deer on their property gone because it's e literally eaten into their income, like literally eating their income, right? Yeah. From an ecology point of view, um, we want deer completely gone because they are out competing and doing damage to, to the environment. So in Australia, like deer genocide is conservation. Yeah, because it's conserving the native environment. If you bring an American mentality to deer hunting in Australia, that means leaving some so they can keep breeding. What's that conserving? That's only conserving hunting. And I love hunting, but I am okay with like eradicating the deer population if it means saving, you know, kangaroos, palamelons, wallabies, you know, cause like like eucalyptus trees you know yeah. like all of that because that's that's more important 
because that's plenty of deal all across the world. Like, it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that was so, just... That's really, really important. And that was just what blew my mind so much was just that difference in that we we as Americans seek to conserve our native animals and hunt them sustainably. But then at the same time, just the idea that the point of hunting deer where you're from is to destroy them all, but people don't want to. It was, it was just very, it was just a very, it was a kind of an awakening for me to realize that. And I hope that viewers kind of feel the same way because it's weird you know it's it's like we you have these programs in place but people have grown so fond of the program that they want to defeat its whole purpose to keep it yeah it's really strange and so then it gets complicated when you introduce like economics to it because not my state but the state next to me new south wales allows um, hunting in state forest in my state it's only private property which you can hunt on so mm. they they have tags where you, you can hunt in the state forestry um, and it's like an independent audit like report has found that hunting in New South Wales is it's like over a hundred million dollar industry mm. that's a significant amount of money so if we are successful in eradicating all introduced animals from at least New South Wales, that's less money um, going into the economy. But what's the price on the natural environment? It might actually be more because, you know, there's like the conservation work of restoring, you know, trees. Then there's the how much damage they actually do to farms um, and whatnot. So it is complicated. But my, and that's like a, a large, large discussion that requires in depth, requires like a lot of math and all that yeah. in depth discussion. But yeah, my concern is just like the hunting community, like vilifies anyone who suggests that you want to eradicate them because like it's, it becomes like political at that point. Yep. It's like, it's like you saying that you don't want hunting. And if you don't want hunting, you're some lefty. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? And it's like, no, it's not political at all. I just think kangaroos are pretty fucking sick, and I want them to. I want there to be more kangaroos and no deer. And they're important too. See, yeah, if I want deer, I'm going to go to Europe or the United States. And that's how it's it zoo. Like, you know, so so yeah, it's um, it's both complicated and simple at the same time, I think. And, and you seem to be sort of off with the same mindset as well, where it's like, there's nuance to it. Yeah, I, I understand both sides, but I definitely agree that if I was Australian and I had a, a personal stake in this issue, that I would, t I would subscribe to your side on a more personal level. Now, the other side of it is, is like, killing... 20 deer because you, you get packs of sometimes hundreds yeah it's hard i don't mean like physically hard i mean like you just fucking killed 20 deer <laughs> like yeah you just killed like you just took 20 i lives. love animals i love animals like i'm studying a degree in what like my focus is kind of like wildlife focus right yep i love animals but i have and will continue to do so going out and just shoot them mm. hunt them you know but i think it's important like to keep it's... perspective on the alternatives because i mean those deer that you're shooting in the head or in a vital organ would otherwise either go die of starvation dehydration um getting stabbed by an antler during the rut in a fight or something so i think people don't realize yeah. that one, one, one argument I like to use for against hunting being some cruel, evil practice is that animals don't die peacefully in the wild, like almost ever. No, that's right. Especially. That, that's definitely right. Especially, especially herbivores. Yeah, or prey items in general. I mean, you look, like an, you look at an elk or a moose getting taken down by a pack of wolves, that it, it's taking minutes for that, maybe up toward, upwards of an hour or more 
for that animal yeah. to get like torn apart and basically tortured. Whereas hunting practices, A, were, were working toward an, an important mean to conser conserve the ecosystem. And B, in most cases, if you're a decent shot, that that killing is instantaneous or- Yeah, or take it's millions. like, yeah, it like double lungs with an arrow or a bullet will take you down in less than a minute, right? Headshot, yep. which people in the US hate headshots, but we take them because like, yeah, we're probably better at shooting, but also, <laughs> well, also like after, you know, the 10th one, you don't give a shit about the antlers anymore. You don't give a shit about putting it on your wall. Yeah. You just want to get the job done. Mm. So headshot to the brains, easy done. Um, and a lot of people seem to think there's this idea of, oh, it's nature. It'll balance out. There'll be, there'll be harmony. It's like, no, there won't be. Like ecological it's harmony? Yeah. Okay. You know, like it'll, it'll like balance out. And it's like, no, because it took millions of years to get to this pre-introduced, you know, animal state, right? Like yep. millions of years. Bringing something in which takes over niches and whatnot. That doesn't, it doesn't just equal out in a lifetime. It may over millions of years, but it may just destroy the whole thing. It might just be a case of like, it takes everything down with it. It crashes everything with it, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's definitely what happens with horses. So horses is a, like a oof, hugely, hugely controversial topic. Cause I think there's like 300,000 wild horses in Australia. Mm -hmm. Very famously, there was a story by Banjo Patterson called the man from Snowy River, who like in the 1800s was, did some awesome feats and rounded up these wild horses, right? Yep. Like the most famous scene from the, like the poem and then the, like the play and then the movie is him like using a horse to go down this massively steep, like cliff face almost. Mm. And it's, it's spectacular. It's awesome. It's also fucking fake um you know so, so there's that and so a lot of like older australians who even may be hunters they're like oh what would the man from snowy river do so he wouldn't kill all these horses it's like one shut the fuck up two you don't understand the damage that they do so both hunters and like the people hunters hate you know left-wing city people mm. like the, they have the same opinion of don't wipe out these animals. They yeah. think they hate each other, but they actually don't. And it's really funny because horses, they they bite trees. I don't know if you know that, but horses like will, in the wild will bite trees um, okay. because horse teeth continue to grow like forever mm. or until it's old. So if you're a horse owner, you know this, you have to like put like a retainer on the horse and you actually grind down the teeth. Yeah, with like a Dremel almost. Um, so in the wild, they don't have someone to Dremel the teeth down. So they chew on rocks and they chew on trees, which means they kill trees. And again, they're a very large and heavy animal. So they collapse waterways. Um, they trample crops. They trample flora. They're very damaging. Yeah. And of course, they outcompete. You know how much food do you think a horse needs versus a kangaroo like it's very it's very easy to see that yeah just by but body mass people are, yeah but people are like oh my god horses are beautiful it's like it's fucking not but anyway <laughs> like when they're in these packs of like tens or hundreds they just completely wipe out areas and historically um they've contributed to the cause of like mobs of aboriginals dying out because like in the pioneer days, you know, the pioneers go find this watering hole, go for a mm. swim, bath, fill up their canteens, and then let the horses in. And because the horses trampled it, all the water like drains away. And oh, so okay. there have been records of then like Aboriginals coming because they knew there was this water hole there. No water hole, no water. They just die. Because, mm. and that's like terrible. So horses have done all this damage over the years and will continue to do so. But then, yeah, people don't want them cold. And it's yeah. like, no, this is conservation. 
yes, other countries, conservation might be you kill one so you can increase the population, but these aren't Australian animals. We need to wipe them out. And they just, they're like, oh, no, we can't have that. It's like, no, we need to. But then I'm going to flip it on its head. Okay. Only, from what I understand, only two countries have wild horses anymore. So there's no wild horses where horses come from. Naturally occurring wild Naturally horses. Naturally occurring wild horses. Mm. Australia, and they're called Brumbies here when they're wild. And the United States, and they're called Mustangs. Yeah. Okay. So let's just take out the US because we can't dictate what you guys do. There's no more wild horses in the world, but we have some. Yep. Do we have a responsibility to maintain wild horses? Because there's no more. I don't know. Um, especially because they came from domesticated stock, right? Like work horses or race horses or whatever. Yeah. That have escaped or just been released because they're too hard to take care of during droughts. Do we have a responsibility? to to maintain a population of wild horses like this for prosperity's sake mm-hmm. i know that's an interesting argument and it's weird because what you call an australian wild horse is definitely not what wild horses were historically like you said they're domesticated animals that have been rewilded or whatever the term is that's very content that's interesting I mean, my right. argument would be, my argument, which is very surface level and just off of what you've told me, would be, I don't think that responsibility exists, but I could definitely see arguments for both sides. I don't know. Um, I would like to err on the side of we need to get rid of them. Yep. And the countries which were responsible for wiping out wild horses in the area, it's like, you done fucked up. Well, your ancestors did. Um, but it's just what it is. Like, we got to get rid of them for our own sake, you know, like our own environment's sake. We should be getting rid of them. But it's like. And you're not harming, you're not harming any other than the animals you're taking. You're not harming anyone else by calling these horses. No, no, that's right. Um, it's an overall benefit to the local environment to get rid of them mm. but but then yeah so some, something and you have noticed that something i like to promote is that um environmental issues are very nuanced it's mm. it's not just like i hate it when people say you've got one side on one side and the truth is in the middle like i think that's like the dumbest fucking shit ever that's with like have. any political issue but we're talking about environment here because it's like no, it's not somewhere in the middle. Like they absolutely do extreme amounts of damage to the environment. Yeah. Like, so we have to get rid of them. The means of getting rid of them that can be discussed, I think, because maybe a trap and export program would be okay. Mm-hmm. You know, send it to wherever horses are from. I guess it's expensive, North Africa. Yeah, that's expensive. Another thing I think. So, about- um, so I, I'd definitely be willing to take on that concession with someone and like say, well, yeah, but where these horses lie, you're not going to trap them. Yeah. So if someone in the market comes up with this bang hot fucking 100% effective trap that can work in like the blue mountains and whatnot and can trap them and then find a market for them overseas. Mm-hmm. like someone buys them and then that then puts money into the economy awesome like i would so before that because that's like an entrepreneur i don't know if that's the word um you know finding like using the market to get rid of them yeah and it means they stay alive and that's cool i just don't see that happening so a a system where we get hunters or the government to go and wipe them out is currently the best solution i can think of i think it's the most reasonable solution but it's also the one that will receive more backlash from a large 
percentage of people, which is where it makes it become more difficult. Does it bother you that people who have no understanding of these issues are able to vote on them? <laughs> Do we really want to talk about that? <laughs> I guess I guess we could get into a little dangerous territory. I don't know. What, what do, you, do you think it's? We'll keep it. We'll keep it general and light. Do you okay, think that? So, yeah. Hey, go ahead. No, keep going. All right, I'll, yeah, I'll phrase it. So, do you think that it is problematic that, especially in in local elections, that people can vote on environmental issues when they don't understand the nuances of ecology, of conservation, of biology, and that the people can make these decisions for how policy is conducted? Yes and no. So it's weird. Yes, it gets into voters' yeah. rights. It gets into... I don't give a fuck about that. Um, <laughs> I'm done with that shit. So, but it's more like maybe there should be some sort of, and this this will be like, oh, you're restricting people's fucking vote and shit. But some people's like, they just to vote on an important topic like this that will have far-reaching effects on the environment and the economy. And by extension, those people that are voting. Yes. You should be able to show that you do have a level of understanding with the topic. Mm. But that can be abused because then some local councillor or a, a state parliamentarian can be like, well, you need a degree then, okay, yeah. as the barrier. Now, this will be a bit political, but I don't want to talk about the political part. The last couple of decades, I guess, educational institutions have leaned one way politically. Yep. And there has been some indoctrination that way. And sometimes then that leads to even in, that leads to bias when told about something that should be objective, okay? So yep. that might lead to crazy animal lovers, like people who are kind of like the Peter, a four, a, a four le letter, <laughs> letter acronym, oh, being, well, you know, <laughs> being part of, um, part of the decision making process. Right. Because yep. now you've just restricted other people who, who might actually have this level of understanding, but they've just read like books and shit and they haven't actually, because they're like a businessman, but they have an interest in this. It's an informal form you know, of education. Yeah, so I would like people to have a level of understanding and not this knee-jerk reaction of like, but horses are cute, but deer are cute. It's like, first of all, deer pee on themselves before they go and mate. So are they really cute? And second, it's like, shut the fuck up. Like, you don't, if that's your input, you have no input yeah. because it's bad. But then, yeah, it, if we have a barrier of entry, you know, to, to have a say, that's going to leave out people. It's like, I get my degree, right? Mm -hmm. In a year, two years, I don't know. Depends if I fail stuff. Yeah, don't fail stuff. Do I, just because I have a degree, have a better understanding of, like, nature and stuff than, like, Steve Rinella, mm. who has, like, a journalist degree or something? Yeah. Like, like, let's say he was Australia, like, let's say he was in Australia kind of thing. Like, mm. had that informal education. Like, just because I have a degree, would I then have more knowledge and and have a better say than him? I don't think so. Um, eventually, would I? Probably. But, like, not just because I have a degree. The so degree is not the threshold, yeah. Yeah. So having a barrier of entry can be abused very easily. Um, so it's like, yeah, does it annoy me that people with just less than a base level understanding and knee-jerk reactions have a say? Yeah, it, it does annoy me, but the alternatives can be abused, like, much worse. Um, so instead of complaining about it, what can I do? Media. 
get a degree exactly. and go into media education and yeah if i if i have enough time to complain about something i have enough time to try and fix it it's a good way to look at it yeah i don't know if you i don't know if you'd agree with that kind of stuff but well you know me i i do a little you you like to call me out on any bitching and moaning i might do but i try to keep it to a minimum and instead be constructive um right but yeah, that's just something I think media is so cool in that we can do this right now. Like right now we are literally speaking this education into existence. We're talking about these conservation issues and being able to put more nuance and opinion out there for people to form their own opinions and gain more ecological understanding. So I definitely right. think it's just, it's just so cool to be able to do that. And I'm glad that you share that passion in the way that I do because it's a really cool thing. And it goes back to like, I mean, it all goes back to like Steve Irwin, just going back to just showing people cool animals and, and turning conservation from yelling at people that they have to stop being horrible and using plastic and destroying the earth and humans are evil to Steve Irwin who in, sunk, who sunk to or sought to inspire rather than to indoctrinate by yeah. bringing the passion to the wildlife and making people love the animals so that they could find their own passion to conserve it instead of just feeling like it's the right thing to do. Right. Definitely. And, and it's like, consider this, let's say we'd never talked before, right. Or about this topic. Yep. And I said to you, I was like, like, like a couple of weeks ago, if I said to you, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going out hunting this weekend for deer. You'd be like, oh, that's pretty cool. Mm. And then I came back to you, you as an American and I said, and you're like, oh, I had your trip go. And I said, oh yeah, I killed like 20 deer. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think your reaction would be? I'd be like, holy shit. You'd be like, what the fuck? Like, are you, were you poaching? Were you like, what? Like, yeah. That's fucked up. But with the understanding, right, that we can spread this, this information that that's what the norm in Australia needs to be, right? Yes. Then you're like, okay, within the context of Australia being this like a crazy place, it's like, oh, okay, this makes sense. Uh, that's actually not fucked up. Mm. kind of is um but it's like yeah that that's not as fucked up as it would be if someone in like kansas was like fuck yeah it's gonna kill some deer and yeah. then it's like you know what i mean like and yeah i mean like, you can further expand that with the passion that the more the more deer that you kill the more kangaroos you save so if you make someone passionate about, say, kangaroos and native marsupials, then all of a sudden that what they may see as a necessary evil of killing deer becomes a lot less hard to digest. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, so it's like, yeah, to come back to it, it's like, yeah, I do get annoyed that these people have a say when they're not informed, but that means it's then on me to inform. And if I can make money doing that, it's going to be even better. And mm. that's, it's like part of why at 24, I was like, yeah, I'm going to roll into university because <laughs> that's, you know, something to do. Absolutely. Passes the time. And the media part yeah. is so easy now. I mean, we talk, we talk about Steve Irwin, but there's also so many other shows on Animal Planet that we grew up with or Discovery Channel. And it's all, that's what the wildlife media was, was cable. Any television. in particular? Um, I mean, mostly anything on Animal Planet for me, Mutual of Omaha's, um, the Attenborough documentaries I've always loved, anything of that nature, but it was all, it was all like cable television. And now we have the internet and we can do, you know, podcasting so huge now, YouTube is so big. And it's like anyone who has the passion and even like a smartphone camera or a cheap microphone can go out and they can spread their passion and educate. So I think it's really cool that there's so many more avenues now to educate and people with low budgets can get into it. Yeah. Um, so like cable here, right. Mm. Is through a company called Foxtel. You, I don't know how many different cable providers there are in the U S like for cable TV, Yeah, but we have one. Really? We have one. You, you get this, you get this like box and then you, you pay X amount of dollars a month to get a certain amount of channels and then you pay 
more money to get more channels. Right? Yeah, that's our that's our general structure. Yeah. So to get um, like Discovery, Nat Geo is now on Disney Plus, but it wasn't before. To get like yeah, Discovery and then all those channels, mm -hmm. uh, the doc documentary stuff, it's one hundred and five dollars a month. I can't whistle, but whistle noise. <laughs> That's expensive. So yeah. there's there's one there's one show that I want to watch, um, which I cannot about finding extinct animals, but I can't it, watch it. What's it called? Uh, it's called Extinct or Alive. <laughs> and but I can't watch it because I'm not paying 105 dollars a month, man. So yeah. like that's just not happening. But mm. you know I can watch YouTube. Mm. I can go to the library and watch YouTube yep. pretty easily. That's Take some free. headphones, go in. Yeah, well, I think it is at least. So if you have internet, yeah, yeah, like you can you can do. That. I mean, like if I if I am poor and I don't have internet at home, I can yeah, yeah. go to the library and watch YouTube. I'll have to deal with ads, but that's okay. For short, sure. it's still you know the library. It's got aircon. It's nice. It's out of the sun. What's air? There's a water, air conditioning, AC. Oh. I've never. I, I don't think we call it aircon. We just say AC or mm -hmm. air conditioning. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know you don't. I'm never... specifically why I said that. Oh, you, uh, you bastard. So, but it's like you know, there's like water. There, it's like shelter. So yeah, you know, you you can be informed now because because of YouTube, you don't have to have this. It's very expensive subscription service, which is um, which is awesome. It's just yeah, and you can so, make it too. Yeah, yeah, can, that's right. You can view you can view content, and then you can also, like I said, buy cheap equipment, and I don't know, go out in your local wild wild wilderness areas, find animals, catch them, talk about them, whatever, and you can put that on YouTube and make it public domain for literally billions of people to have access to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So because I'm in a position where I, I can start doing that, um, if I want to if I want to complain, then I have to try and fix it, and that's through through media, and it's it's possible. Yeah. Even if I get like ten people, I'm still at least gonna try, and that's that's cool. important. I think it's for a lot of people. Don't be shy. Tell tell the people what you're uh, hoping to get into in regard to media. Well, that all depends on if I can like find someone who can hold a conversation um, nicely. Is the start would be a podcast of sorts. Yep. Similar to um, mine. What what would you want to call it? What was the title you were working with? We won't worry about that for now. Okay. Because. <laughs> Depending on people, person, that mm. may or may not be a thing. You know what okay. I mean? Um, and we might have to go from scratch. But yeah, no, like, I know we've been talking. You want to start a you podcast. Know, You've been uh, yeah. screwing around, making some content, trying to find your way. And I think that's cool. It'd, it'd probably be pretty kind of similar to my. Well, I have a very guest oriented show. I know that you kind of want to either go solo or have a co-host and kind of have like a recurring segmented kind of show, but would you keep that relevant to Australia or would you kind of cover a worldwide basis? Um, <clears throat> I feel like it's intellectually dishonest of me to talk about like European problems Yeah, because I do know a lot of their stuff, but like, base level yeah. i don't know i don't have a european viewpoint on the environment i don't understand i know they complain about america all the fucking time and they're you always like oh, fucking, firsthand. and they're always like oh americans don't know what to do whilst they have like no forest left but yeah it's like bro do you think that tulip field is natural fucking no. retard um <laughs> But so I will talk about that. But I mean, like, I don't, I, I, I shouldn't talk about like Norway's hunting programs or, you know, 
wolf conservation in Germany or something. Like, you know, I just don't know. I do know yeah. a fair bit about the US and I think I could probably get away with talking about US stuff. Yep. But I think I wouldn't be able to give the best perspective. On and it. and yeah, I think yeah. I'd be pretty dishonest. Like if I was to say, hey, I'm an expert in that. I mean, I don't even say I'm an expert on Australian stuff, but I have a good understanding. So I think it would mostly be just Australia based mm. and New Zealand because, I mean, look, New Zealand is pretty much owned by Australia. It's not, but, <laughs> but you know. I've seen I've seen that um that complex in your speech your your dominion over New Zealand. Yeah, they think they're better, but like no one Damn. even knows where you are. Damn Kiwis! <laughs> if it wasn't for Lord of the Rings, no one would even know New Zealand exists. <laughs> so New Zealand's cool though. I growing up, I was very fascinated in the Tuatara. It's such a crazy yeah. animal. Yeah, so it, that's a lizard that lives for like three hundred years. But it's not a lizard. That's Did you right. know that, Mr. Smart Guy? Uh, I <laughs> had an inkling, but that wasn't the point. It looks like a lizard. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, the Tuatara is, it's mostly related to crocodilians, I believe. Uh, it's, its, yeah. own, its own order of reptile, I think. Well, because I think it's a living fossil. Yeah, it's one uh, of those species that they call living fossil, but super, in, in the terms of evolution, super old, genetically old animal only endemic to New Zealand. It looks like a lizard, but it's not in genetic yeah. terms. Super cool animal. I would encourage yeah, anyone listening to look it up. They're, they're potentially a lizard. Like, I shouldn't say lizards because you just said not to. But yeah, there are potentially these two Ataras um, that were like alive, just vibing, eating insects or whatever when the US Civil War was going on. They really, they have that lifespan, 300 years, or two, three. I did not know that. I just assumed they yeah. were. Hmm. That's kind of like the thing that makes them special. Well, I just called them special because they're just so different, but I didn't know that they grew so old. Yeah, that is old. That is like old as hell. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. New Zealand has a lot of really, really cool stuff. Um, they also have introduced animals. And the same... Some of which are Australian. What's that? Some of which are Australian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so... The so brush-tailed the, possum's the big the one, right? The brush-tailed possum, which here is like, oh my God, that's awesome. But over there, Kiwis are like, fuck the brush-tailed possum. And there's even been like bounties on them because mm. they just cause so much, so many problems. New Zealanders hate them, um, which... You know, I think that's just part of Australia just, like, fucking with foreigners. It's, like, part of our culture. It's just to fuck with foreigners constantly. And maybe that I've means there's problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but they also have red stags, so red, red deer. Yeah. Um, they have chamois, which is, like, a goat thing. And tar, which is also, like, a goat thing. Mm. And and they they have the same problems where the New Zealand Department of Conservation doc, um, they want to wipe them out. And they actually encourage hunting. So this is a government department, which is all like like on their website, they want you to hunt them. They like they encourage the hell out of hunting chamois and tar. Yeah. But then hunters are all like, and then in the national parks and this and whatnot in New Zealand, they do helicopter calls because they live in the alpine regions. Mm-hmm. But then the hunting community, which is mostly non-Australians, are all like, oh, sorry, non-New Zealanders, and are mostly like Australians, are like, oh my God, this is a travesty. You can't kill them all. It's like, shut the fuck up. Yes, because they think they don't do any damage. They just see this goat in the mountains because they come from like the Himalayas. Yep. So they see him, oh, it's like, that's the natural environment. It's like, no, it's not because the flora is different. And they yeah. fuck up the flora, which then New Zealand is like very fragile. So, you know, eventually they will just crash the whole thing. Um, and 
people who hunt chamois tar in New Zealand can't get this through their head that it is a good thing to wipe these animals out. Um, Do you think they're more in tune with that than Australians are with deer in general? Yeah, there, there's definitely more of a reservance towards chamois and tar within the hunting community mm. because it is like very difficult to hunt them most of the time because like mountain hunts are hard. Like you got to be a mountain climber with a yeah. fucking rifle. Yeah. Or, or a bow if you're a bow hunter. So it's like hard and people like that. But then, yeah, they just think that they don't do any damage. Like they honestly believe they didn't do any damage to the environment even though Doc has studies up and which shows how they do the damage, mm. but they just, they just like don't want to listen. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, again, New Zealand has the same problems as Australia and, but they're just less cool than Australia just in general. Just in, in all ways of life and aspects of being. Yes. Except for temperature. Um, and that way they are more cool, but otherwise they're just, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'll um, I'm sure if I meet a New Zealander, I'll find him way less interesting, and generally appealing than you in all fashions. They will say like the opposite of what I'm saying, though. But they're lying. And you're telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. How it okay. Is. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come on, mate. You know what's going on. Um, it's just it's just how it is so but what i'm gonna ask you a question yeah and i'm gonna give context to it just in regards to like chamois and tar so new zealand has a lot of public land very similar to the united states in right. which you, and because these are introduced animals you don't even need a tag you can just like rock up walk out bush and kill them and new zealand's actually even in these public land areas, like in really rough areas, have um, like cabins, which you can stay in, like for free. Like just randomly, you'll be hiking and you'll see a cabin with a bed mm. and you can just stay there. It's really cool. Hmm. Um, it's, it's really, really cool. But it means some small towns have hinged their income on hunters, not more than 50% of the income is hunters, but at least a statistically significant portion of these towns' income comes from hunters because you, you have like outfitters. You have outfitters in the US where they just like guide you. Yep. Um, and that's like a very expensive process. And then there's like, you gotta, you know, you gotta go to the local fucking like, grocery store and get groceries when, when you come into town. So, so some of these small towns have a statistically significant portion of their income derived from hunting these chamois and tar. If they're wiped out, that's a large portion of income taken away. Right? Makes sense? Yep. Now, especially when it comes to environmental issues, do people or other, what right or do people have a right to make money how they see fit? If it doesn't, like, outside of, like, harming other people. Like, Hitman is obviously in a, a an income which we should not allow. But Don't be a Hitman. If, do people have a right to make an income off of this? I'll give you an example. You have a wannabe politician, politician over in the United States. Yep. Andrew Yang, who loves truck drivers and and he hinges his like political base off of truck drivers which i think he knows nothing about truck driving he talks about how in a certain amount of time there will be like driverless trucks essentially like ai driven trucks yeah. and they're probably electric so they can just like keep driving until they're gone and the thing is it's like these trucks will cause less car crashes that cause less people to harm themselves because in the US you have this truck drive like mindset where you gotta take awakening pills for twenty hours a day and just keep driving and driving. Like you know, you know that's what happens, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, okay. So and then people are naturally scared they're gonna lose their jobs because 
or they've ever known as truck driving. Mm -hmm. do, do people have a right to be a truck driver? I don't mean to try and be a truck driver and compete with AI trucks, but do you have a right, like a government mandated right, where it's like, okay, you want to be a truck driver? We will ensure you have this income. I you know see what, what you're saying now. That's so, argument, okay. The, okay, so and just to, just to give one more example, just so you have the full context. Let's say people finally understand that refined sugar is bad. Yep. And we have these like massive health campaigns saying, okay, we have conclusive evidence. If you have refined sugar, you're fucking yourself up. Mm -hmm. And and we can find these alternatives like monk fruit or stevia or some shit, right? Naturally, people who farm sugar are going to make less money. Yes. Do they have a right to make money from farming sugar? I don't know. So now, do these towns have a right to make money off of Shami and Tar, especially when you take into consideration that Shami and Tar are fucking up their environment? They're fucking up not just the environment, but their environment. Yeah, so... Let me kind of rephrase this because it took me a minute to understand where you're coming from. We talk about how hunting deer in Australia, people want to sustainably hunt the deer so that they can keep that, that activity that they've grown up with and enjoy. Then you're yep. taking it from a business perspective in New Zealand where you're, you're saying people make their livelihoods on guided hunting trips and their ability to support themselves hinges on the existence of this practice. So should the government be able to keep these invasive species at a sustainable rate instead of eradicating them so that people won't lose their jobs? That's what you're getting at, right? Under understanding that an introduced animal does not have a sustainable rate because it fucks up the local environment. Yeah, well, understanding that its existence is continuing to bring ecological damage. Yes. Yeah, and I, and I would argue no, but at the same time, I mean, I think a great example now would be um, one of the more controversial things that our now President Biden said during the debate was that he was he was looking to really get on top of transitioning us out of oil and fossil fuels, which is you know a huge huge job market in the United States, and that's the type of thing like yeah if we if we go about it correctly and transition out of fossil fuels that would likely be a healthy thing for our climate and for our world, but you're still removing those jobs. And it, what would probably con constitute millions of jobs at that point from oil workers. So just because the world is transitioning out of that, should we hinder our own progress to keep people's jobs? That's the argument. Right. But specifically, you know, I'm thinking like with this, because you've got, and I guess, like, in Texas, you have, like, whole towns built around the oil industry. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so in New Zealand, you have these towns, which, because it's not just the outfitters who make money, it's, you know, the, the local grocery stores, it's the um, fuel service stations, it's the local hunt shop, it's the local survival shop kind of deal, you know, like. Whoever, whatnot. yeah, who, wherever people that are coming in to hunt go and spend money yeah hotels and whatnot yeah. um so it's like because there's no such thing as a sustainable invasive population no. because the other thing is it's like you because they overeat as well so like the grasses don't come back at the proper rate yeah. um and whatnot so they, they need like ever expanding amounts of land um water and whatnot but it's like yeah these these towns have an income based mm -hmm. off of this so if the government comes and wipes them out it's like well i don't know do they have a right to make money like a right not a right to attempt to make money but a right to make money do off they of have, do they have a right to i'm trying to phrase this just right do they have a right to have a certain career path open to them despite it being 
otherwise harmful or damaging in some yes. aspect. It's like it's like asking if what's the technology that's been it's like trying to support a rotary phone company in 2021. Should a, a yeah. should a rotary phone company be given the resources to produce rotary phones when nobody wants them at the detriment of people through I don't know taxes and subsidies or whatever. Yeah. I would say no. So it's right. like so that's the thing is we have to we have to kind of examine that relationship between the emergence of or the progression of technology and the progression of in this case certain political issues or certain environmental understandings. And we have to so, kind of balance that with the economy. So are you gonna to go to and by you I just mean a hypothetical you being a, a Kiwi government worker, gonna to go to a family who has like three kids and be like taking your dad's job away. Mm. Like say like, tomorrow we're gonna to wipe out all this chamois, which means your dad, the outfitter, will no longer have a job. And your dad, let's say his dad did the same thing. He was grown up on that, maybe it's the family business. He has no other I mean, this isn't a guarantee, but it's potentially likely that he has no other uh, qualifications for other jobs. So now he is out of his livelihood and has nowhere to go. So it, right. in that case, you've just screwed over potentially a lot of people and a lot of families. But it's in the name of doing the right thing for the natural resources that you have present. Right. So, yeah, it's like, that's why I like, so I'm like even contradicting myself earlier when I said we need to wipe them out. Like, there's biology which is like everything you really need to look at many many different viewpoints yeah and taking many factors it's not just here here meet in the middle it's like no it's like a zigzag fucking like there's so many different things to factor in when you make a decision yeah exactly. um, and it's, it's it's like not easy it's it's not easy at all like man um, new zealand environment is awesome I want yeah. to conserve it, but I also like people having food on their plates <laughs> and not being homeless, not being like poor, you know? Yeah. As, as conservationists and even as constituents in general, we need to be able to have the conversations that, like we're having now and form a nuanced opinion and being like, instead, and instead of just being like, Oh, deer are cute. Don't kill them. I like them. We need to be able to have that nuance so that you have an educated voting choice and an educated choice when making these decisions. Yeah. I definitely agree with you on that. Yeah. So with Australia, like in my state, there's not that many people making money off of like deer. So it's like, it'd be okay. But rural New Zealand, mm. man, um, it'd be like, yeah, I think the closest thing would probably be like the towns built around an oil field or or maybe even farm towns in like Ohio or something, you know, yeah. like the whole income is like corn, you know, you know what I mean? Like that's kind but, of what rural New Zealand is like, like isolated towns yeah. where there's no, and like in the big cities, you do have city jobs and stuff, but like not the small towns, small towns have a hinge on one or two kind of forms of income. And then you've got the supporting businesses like hotels and stuff. Well, I like the oil comparison because even though the, the our energy sources are an issue for another day, we can agree that burning oil is not helping our world. So getting rid of that in an idealistic scenario would be good. But at the same time, we're destroying those jobs. And it's the same thing with these invasive issues, getting rid of these invasive goats whatever, or other ungulates, whatever else would be very good for the environment, but it's destroying jobs. Yeah. So it's like, I don't know exactly what the answer would be, but I, I do think like the end goal should be eradication, but the pathway to that eradication, I think more people need to be open to. Like, you need to be, it's like, look, maybe we introduce some sort of like, like you've had the term, like it comes with like, like housing boom, or bubble rather, yep. like housing bubble, like some sort of financial bubble, um, but have a controlled bubble 
where it's like, hey, for the next five years, they're going to promote the fuck out of hunting Shami and Ta. Promote the fuck out of it, right? Mm. And encourage everyone from all over the world to come and do it. And so this town gets like enough money where they can sort of get the finances for another career path, maybe. Yeah. You know, like, um, I, don't, I don't know. And, and maybe that would be horrible, but it could be. Yeah. A bubble could more deflate, people. A bubble could pop. But I see what you're, but you're yeah, going with it. Like, that's why it's, it's controlled, like a controlled deal. Um, but yeah, it's like more people need to be open to the idea that we need to eradicate these for the environment. And it's not for some city left-wing reason because hunting is bad. It's just, it's like, no, it's just because we don't want to destroy the environment. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but well, you just said it pretty much. Mm. All right, well, we've kind of hit our time here. I know we did, we've already honestly had about an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah. Good conversation. This is not me and Dan's first rodeo. We've done many... A conversation late at night with plenty of intellectual conversation as well as witty banter and light roasting and that all happened on a, a certain discord that i'd like to talk about real quick so for my listeners who aren't aware uh dan and i listen to a podcast called the wild times which is hosted mm-hmm. by celebrity wildlife biologist forrest galante he is the host of extinct or live on animal planet which is a fantastic show. I'd recommend watching it. Um, but yeah, so this is just our little plug. That's how me and Dan met, and it's a really cool community. So I'd recommend if you're into wildlife podcasts, go look at the Wild Times. Uh, it's not as much like mine. It's much more comedic, uh, but also very informative. But yeah, it's a great show. So we go in there, we talk all the time, and it's just fun. It's fun to, it goes back to the whole, how we were talking about how the internet is so good for wildlife media. I, the discord is definitely another version of that where we have most of my friends at college are engineering majors. They don't care about the environment or they don't care about wildlife, but I've gone and found the podcast and found the discord and met all sorts of cool people and made and even made friends. I'd even, oh, call you, you? I'd even call you my friend, Dan. Oh, I wouldn't. <laughs> Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's what me and Dan met. Very cool. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming on, Dan. It was very good. We did have our show doc outline and we only got through like half of our content. So if you ever find the time to come on again, I'm sure we can put out many an hour of good stuff. Yeah. Well, like I said, today, like March 1st is when my semester starts. Mm. Um, it was just very lucky that the class I have on Mondays starts in week two, not week one. So Very like, fortuitous. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe in a few weeks' time, I've in five weeks' time, I've mid-semester break, which is like a break for one week. Um, maybe again then, or if I'm on top of my assignments. If. We Unlikely. shall see. Well, yeah, either but, way. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. I it was very enjoyable. I'm glad we got to talk. And it just goes uh, hand in hand how I like to have guests on because there's so many things in wildlife that I don't know anything about. So I like to bring on people who know more than me about certain things and let them sound off, make me look like an idiot. Oh, well, I'd do that, you know, just in general, if you want. Yeah, I mean, you de- you, you definitely do. <laughs> <laughs> like i'll do that anytime honestly i'm definitely i'm definitely made humble by our antics all, all the time through all sorts of conversations whether it be about wildlife whether it be about girls whether it be about the way i dress dan's always ready to really show his australian roots and just roast the hell out of me yeah sometimes i'm just like Ugh. yeah just like that the other way for all my listeners, thank you for tuning in. Be sure to like and subscribe, all this good stuff. Check us out on YouTube for the video version, Spotify, all those platforms. And see you next episode. Thanks for joining. That's fine.